I'm Heidi Kuhn, your host of the Los Altos History Show. You've just seen a clip of the grand reopening gala of History House. We have as our guest here this evening, Erin Finnegan. Erin, welcome. Thank you. Erin <laughs> is the coordinator of the Los Altos History Center and was our host yesterday. And Erin, uh, thank you again for joining us. Erin is responsible for the museum's reopening. That must have been quite uh, an experience after observing that firsthand yesterday. It was. It was a year of, of intense artifact searching and putting together the event, but I certainly wasn't alone. There's a huge committee at History House that have been involved in this all the way. It's well, I guess fun. for our viewers, the most important thing is to know where History House is actually located here in it, Los Altos. It's actually right along San Antonio Road. It sits behind the library on the Civic Center property. And of course, that's because the house itself belonged to J. Gilbert Smith. And when he sold his property to the city for a civic center, he maintained the rights to the home until he and his wife's death. And then it was passed to the city in the 70s. Now, that, that's very interesting because the house uh, was erected er, in the early 1900s, but the museum staff chose to select the 1930s as the period in which to uh, focus the whole gala event. Why, yeah. was, why the 30s? It, it was something that was decided in conjunction with Patty Leach, who was the director prior to myself. And, and I think it was a good decision. The 1930s are a really interesting era to interpret for a museum. For one, you don't see a lot of museums interpreting that era yet. And it's exciting because we have a lot of firsthand advice and experience on the part of our volunteers in the community still and it touches the hearts of a lot of people and triggers memories and and it also is nice because it's a a time when people really reused the the couches and, and furnishings and not a lot has survived so it's important to get what's out there <laughs> into a museum since you've mentioned that there's not a lot done in the 1930s that must have been quite a research project uh, determining uh, the types of, of food that fill the cupboards all the way down to how to set a uh, dining room table circa 1930. It really was. It was a compilation of, of everybody's memories and a lot of pouring over Sunset magazines and of course we had the help of a lot of consultants. One in particular was Shirley Henderson at the Antiquarium in Los Gatos. So it's, it's been a year of research. 
Well, tell us a little bit more about the kitchen. I mean, it was a very different time for women in the 1930s. The kitchen was the primary center of the workforce, so to speak. Definitely, and especially in this case because it's an orchard home. And, mm -hmm. and so certainly they were cooking a lot of the things from scratch. And in the 30s, you start, start to see some modern products that we're used to, but not your instant <laughs> cake mock mixes. Mix. So it was a big difference. A lot more time was spent there. And, and we had a lot of fun with our kitchen in particular, because by the time it came to be the museum, it was hardwood floors. And, and we made the decision that linoleum something really important so just structurally we made a lot of changes with the curtains in the linoleum and and then we really filled it with 30s products. Mm -hmm. Now the, they have hardwood floors or, or linoleum? Yeah. They have linoleum, or we put in linoleum oh, and that was something Nan Geschke and Diane Lilligridge were involved in mm -hmm. specifically in doing some research and consulting with people involved in historic rehabilitation, so mm -hmm. um, linoleum is authentic. <laughs> <laughs> the designer kitchen of the 30s. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. Well, I understand the museum did their homework, the reopening committee, uh, by hiring a consultant to uh, interpret the overall plan before embarking on this piecemeal, so to speak. Yeah, and it was a big help. Jim Gilmore, who's at the Campbell and now the Cupertino Museum, met with a group of, of volunteers and myself, and we put together an interpretive plan, and it's really, it, it was a good step for the museum. And it kind of eliminates that individual conflict and you have a, a general theme and plan for each room and, and he was a big help in, in getting us started and directed and we followed that in putting it together. Now, when I think of the 1930s, I often, as many of the viewers may, uh, think of the Depression. Uh, how did the Depression affect the citizens of Los Altos, and how was that reflected in their lifestyle? And that's been our primary focus in the interpretation, beyond what we've discussed with the, the furnishings and trying to be authentic. Um, the most important two things that we focused on are the Depression as a, a national backdrop, certainly trying to bring in issues of the economic depression. and, and and trying to introduce to children the idea that children in the 30s had very different lives and they worked a lot harder and everybody had less. And, and then we've tried to make that also focus on the importance of family to people during that depression and, and some of the, the activities that centered in the living room and around the radio. And so we've brought in the depression in, in some of those ways and then specifically in Los Altos, we've interpreted the, the area it's, it's exciting that it's a farmhouse and we're able to go back to a time in Los Altos when orchards were the predominant um, part of the economy in the Santa Clara Valley and we've really tried to introduce that concept as well. So though they were in, in essence uh, possibly cushioned a bit more than other industrial cities because, Definitely, yeah. because of the uh, reliance upon agriculture. And the entire state of California actually at the onset of the depression was in good shape because of the agricultural economy. Then of course you, you get a lot of people coming out from the Midwest and California's economy eventually did plummet <laughs> along with the rest of the nation but obviously the, the orchardists in Los Altos were better off because they could raise their own vegetables in the garden. And, and I think that the apricot and walnut economy was also holding it together enough during the 30s to bring in an income mm -hmm. for the families. Mm -hmm. I noticed that nice bread on the table yesterday. Yeah. That <laughs> so they were a little surviving. better off. They could eat at least. Yeah, yeah. Well, we primarily yesterday now toured the house, but I understand there's other areas of interest that uh, uh, Los Altons may be interested in visiting that are on the premises. Can you tell us yeah. about those? Well, we have a one acre, approximately a one acre plot of land, and then also on the Civic Center is a one acre orchard. So right there, if you come to History House, you can get a good look at an apricot orchard. Um, on the, the History House property, we have, in addition to the house, a 1930s garden area and we have um, or we are getting a vegetable garden around the back so that'll be some things to focus in the garden we have a wonderful tank house and tank houses were an important part of, of Los Altos and what's a tank house for those who are, are well, not familiar yeah they're an important part of the history of Los Altos I think what what basically they exist with a tank on the top of this structure mm -hmm. and the idea was to pump the water from underground up into the tank and it ultimately created through gravity water pressure for either watering the orchards just in this case probably just for the household it's a six gallon mm -hmm. tank but not only is the tank house interesting to the history of the town but it's also wonderful because it was going to be torn down oh. and Marion Grimm had it moved onto our property so it's kind of got a dual preservation and interpretation function we have a, an outhouse that had a similar 
background in being brought in. Um, the house, history house itself, had plumbing when it was built, but we thought the outhouse was a good way to introduce how the orchard workers would have been mm -hmm. using it. Very and, authentic. Yeah, it's very neat. authentic. And we have an apricot processing exhibit going on, mm -hmm. as well as a walnut huller, and so there's a lot to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I noticed many of the closets, even upstairs, rather than the traditional walk in closet that uh, many of us ladies yeah. nowadays <laughs> are so, so uh, accustomed to, but it's, it was very functional, very small, and uh, people didn't really have as many clothes. Yeah, uh, and, and that is so true. It's definitely more of a frugal lifestyle. Mm -hmm. There's less of everything. Children had fewer toys, which you can see in our child's room, and, mm -hmm. and certainly the closets are smaller, and, and men and women had their Sunday best and some functional clothing, but not to the extreme that we have now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the hours uh, that uh, History House is open? What are the days in case you perk somebody, okay. some, somebody in the audience come. is interested <laughs> out there and they're all, all lining up at the door? What would be the hours that... Uh, um, right now we're open Wednesday and Saturday afternoons mm -hmm. and we hope to really expand that in the near future. Mm -hmm. are there I'm also there. We're, we're available for appointments. If somebody can't make it on Wednesdays and Saturdays, they can call and come in. A better time. Oh, great, great. Now, there, are there any plans for future structures uh, yes. on the premises? Yeah, we are, are hoping in, in, in the master plan for the city and mm -hmm. for the Civic Center property, they've allotted space for a museum building, which we're really lucky. And, and right now, within the History House, we have a small orientation room with changing exhibits, and in the basement, we store all of the archives. But mm -hmm. ultimately, this building will allow us storage space for the collections of Los Altos, as well as some exhibits space and meeting space, um, room for a gift shop, and so when this building comes into play, we'll be able to have the entire house open just as a historic home. Oh, very, very exciting. Very exciting. Good. Well, thank you, Erin, so much for joining us this evening and uh, sharing all your, your, your tremendous wealth of knowledge. Uh, <sighs> congratulations to you for your many successes, and especially having attended the, the gala opening. It, it's been fun. Thank see. you for having yeah. me. Well, I could see among your peers also presenting you with the roses and all that you put in a lot of well-earned <laughs> hours. <laughs> okay. Well, we want to share the tour that Aaron and I did. Uh, Aaron was gracious enough to lead me on yesterday. And um, we will begin to roll our tape. We thank you for watching the Los Altos History Show, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Welcome to the gala opening of the Los Altos History House Museum. We're here today under sunshiny conditions, the smell of popcorn in the background, beautiful 1930s cars, and of course, the music to go along, typical to the era. Our coordinator of the museum today is Erin Finnegan, and she will be, getting, be giving us a tour. Erin, shall we begin? Sounds good. <laughs> Erin, this room, living room, seems to be very typical of the 1930s. What was the original plan when it was restored? Well, as we discussed earlier, the house was built around the turn of the century, but we, we chose the 1930s as a period to interpret, and we also chose to interpret a typical orchard family in Los Altos in the 30s. We thought that in addition to having the bigger issues of the Depression, we could also focus on the local orchard economy, and, and in this room, we're trying to get across a real typical family life in the 30s. Some of the important things you see here, the overstuffed couch and chair were really typical of the 1930s period. Um, mohair and also the frise fabric. Um, we did a lot of research on the draperies and picked um, obviously the shears and the shades and, and also the material are very common to a 30s household. You know, think a lot of people will remember always having the shades. <laughs> and what about the piping up above the, the curtains there? Oh, the, the molding around the edge of the house was something that was, was um, original to the house, and it's actually been very nice because most families in the 30s hung things from the molding rather than putting nails right in the wall, so it's helped with a lot of the furnishings in the room. Um, Mr. Smith, who built the house, was a, a master craftsman, so a lot of the architecture and, and detail in this house are gorgeous. Erin, I understand that the Loma Prieta earthquake originally initiated the uh, 
the reasons as to why they needed to refurbish the history yeah. house. Is that true? Yeah, the initial project was designed as a stabilization project to, to reinforce the basement with concrete and, and hopefully preserve the house for future generations. And it really worked out well for us because we were able to do this major furnishing as well as, as insulate the walls and paint the walls and, and do some, mm -hmm. some stabilization and renovation. Erin, you've obviously done a beautiful job. But when I think of the 1930s, I often think of music at, typical to the era. Let's take a walk over here and see what we have. A, a big Let's focus. Oh. Oh. So tell us about it. Actually, the, the focus in this room was to interpret what families did before TV. And obviously games were, were very common, as were radio shows. And the, the whole family would gather around the radio at night and listen to these various shows. So what we've done with, with this particular radio is started with the stock market crash and worked through the 30s, ending with Germany declaring war on Poland. And in between are a lot of the themes of commercials and radio shows common for the times. It's kind of fun as people come through if they sit and really listen to this. Especially those who actually listen to it yeah. in the 1930s. Yeah. Well, thank you. Let's move on to our next room. Is that okay? Erin, this is a lovely table to be a hostess of. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, this room was fun to put together. It's um, something a, a lot of the members have donated various pieces of the set. And, and I think that now families have lost a, a lot of the sense of sitting down together for a meal. And this kind of is, illustrates the life in the 30s and the importance of the family sitting down to a meal. Well, Erin, this is typically not the designer kitchen of the 90s in here. Women in their time had to do an awful lot of work in the kitchen. And this was really their office. Yeah, and especially as we discussed in, in a farm family, a, a lot of things where it was the advantage in the 1930s during the Depression to be on a farm, it was also a reality for the women to do a lot of the cooking from scratch. This family would have raised apricots and such on the orchard, but also would have had a vegetable garden and their own chickens, and, and she would have been doing a lot of the cooking from scratch. You can see here we have an exhibit on bread making with some various flour and things out, and, and we've really had tremendous... Where the milk? <laughs> <laughs> and a milk jug from Los Altos Creamery. And this, we've had tremendous luck with this room and be able, being able to get a lot of original 1930s food products for the exhibit. So it's a fun room to do. So it wasn't a trip to Drager's, for instance, for the cake decorating. You have your own cake decorating, and you better know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it, it was kind of an interesting, the 30s are a real transition. You're, of course, getting some of the modern utensils, like the stove and the refrigerator in, but certainly not to the extent that we have now. You didn't have the microwaves. You didn't have dishwashers. And, and most of your food, like we said, was really from scratch. You didn't run out and buy the packaged things. And if the milk wasn't available at the creamery, you had your cow in the backyard, I assume, <laughs> here in the orchard. Definitely. I would think on an orchard family that would have been a reality. So. You've, again, done a beautiful job here preserving the integrity of the 1930s feeling. And I'm sure typical of the lifestyle that it was for the women of that time. Yeah, it's been. And and, and I think we have some other things going on in here that are interesting that bring in the typical lifestyle of the women. We have the ironing board, and I think ironing has, has luckily gone out a little bit, but it was another reality. Well, Erin, let's go take a look at some of the cupboards. Let's see what's there for all of us to cook. Well, Erin, here we have a hand mixer. This must have been brand new to be the modern kitchen of the 90s. Aunt Jenny's favorite recipes. <laughs> it is. It's, it's interesting to get to see, I think, for people, some of the products that we are used to in the 90s at the beginning of the <laughs> use of electricity and, and kitchen appliances. And as you can see, this is a Hamilton Beach food mixer, which you can still get a hold of, I think, but they're certainly a little different. <laughs> it's different than my Cuisinart back home, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's a little different than the food yeah. box. Now, Erin, show me the cupboards, and it must have been a challenge to go through Los Altos and the various generous people who donated their products to fill these shelves. And we had a wonderful lady at the antiquarium in, in Los Gatos, actually, who was a big help, who has a lot of 1930s products. But it is challenging to make sure that you get the right labels and they're from the right decade. And, and so it's been fun and interesting, too. Some of these, um, for instance, this coffee can here, you'll recognize the name Schilling on it still. And it does have a copyright date right on it of 
1933. So that, some of them help you out, but I don't think people always keep in mind that <laughs> we're going to need dates on their products. So. How did you do your research? When there weren't dates, how did you do your research? For the majority of the house, a lot of it was pouring over things like Sunset Magazine and, and various magazines from the 30s, as well as publications on the 30s. A lot of the food products have been the help of antique dealers and, and various consultants who are. It must have been a lot of work for you, Erin. It, it was. It was fun. It was a good year. <laughs> so this must be a real gala celebration for you. It is. For all yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a, a relief to have everything come together, and, and it's also disappointing because it's done. <laughs> but it's nice to see it. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> we'll move on to our next room. Erin, this is the master suite. It's quite lovely, very simple bassinet for the child. And then over here to the dresser, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the ladies' vanities of the 30? Well, this is a really interesting piece. We, we had a dilemma when we were looking for a bedroom set, but our feeling was that one big difference probably between the 90s and the 30s was that if you were going out and buying a bedroom set, it would have been a piece that, as you can see, is a really good quality, lovely piece and, and that was really common even with, with farm families and, and throughout that all the furniture was all ornate and, and nicely finished. Um, this particular dressing table is, is interesting. It demonstrates some of the differences in, in products as you can oh see. Oh my goodness. Hair rolling has come a long way. Look <laughs> and that I think everyone's the, probably relieved the, that this is the hot not curlers. They have to do every day. Yeah. Oh as my grandmother would say put a wiggle in your hair. Oh. <laughs> That's cute. It's cute. I, now I can understand why. Yeah, and, oh, and one thing that was really common on the, on most of the dresser sets were the comb and brush sets of mm -hmm. celluloid. So we had to make sure to have one of those out on our dressing table. Mm -hmm. um, back to the hair curling. This is kind of an interesting 1930s curling iron. You get a little Art Deco flair in there. Mm -hmm. Again, how interesting because it, they're so small. I know. About a quarter of an inch rather than the ones today, which are at least a, a good inch, exactly. inch and a half. So it is. It's a, a difference, I think, in, in appearance as well. Tighter curls. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Oh, yeah. These are the perfumes now in a farmhouse. They still took pride in, in their appearance. Of yeah, course. and as you see, you do have the, the face pattern and, and the perfumes and some of the products that are still common today, but you're short a lot of the makeup products that we've all gotten used to. So it's kind of an, it's an interesting contrast between the two decades. Very, very, very nice. Well, let's progress over here. Here's another, of course, beautiful piece of furniture here. And the pillow would be, what, a local Californian manufactured, or did they get this in the Orient? Who knows? <laughs> well, that's an honest <laughs> answer. How about the uh, how about the chair? Tell me about the chair. Arrived yesterday. So oh, it did. Well, there you go. I well, know that some it's authentic '30s fabric. Mm -hmm. One of the it's members very beautiful. of the committee brought it in and said that, but I'm not actually sure where. It, yeah. Where it originated. That, the, the chair, though, was part of the house, or actually, again, the, you selected it. Yeah. We unfortunately didn't have any of the furnishings from the Smith family mm. when, when we came to have the house. It was actually purchased by the city. And so all of the furnishings have been acquired in one way or the other. A lot of the bigger pieces we, as an association, purchased. And um, a lot of the smaller pieces, the, the quilt on the bed and a lot of the clothing were donated by local residents. Nice. So. And of course, there's a radio once again. Here we go, Erin. <laughs> we've had fun interpreting the big big radio time that was from the 30s through the 50s and and we've really tried to select some 1930s hits that people will recognize and this particular radio plays musical hits um, over the rainbow is on there a lot of Shirley Temple's hits are on there and some of the early Bean Crosby so. oh and here's the beautiful of course <laughs> So this was fun, actually. I'm involved in making that. So it's, Great. it's been fun. And we also have um, Ma Perkins and a whole tape of soap operas, which we felt would have been most commonly near the sewing machine during the day, mm -hmm. where if somebody were doing the showing, they could listen to the soap operas. So it's also good for people coming through on the tour. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, this is the husband's vanity over here. The at the way we've put it together, this particular drawer, yes, is the husband's various things. We were lucky we managed to find some 1930s undershirts and, and socks and things. As oh. Kind of fun pieces in the drawer. So there's a lot of elements 
on display even in the drawers. Um, actually, we've interpreted the dress so that it's both the the um, male and female mm -hmm. share it, and then obviously it was her vanity. So I see. I see. Well, again, a beautiful job. Let's take a look at the closet. Okay, and the closets again are not the closets of the 90s where we have used to so much space, but they were succinct and to the point. Are there any particular pieces in here that uh, you've collected for both the husband and the wife that you'd like to share? Yeah, it, it actually was really fun. The, the men's clothing has been a lot harder to come by than the ladies' clothing, mm -hmm. and it was a challenge, but we were lucky. We, we ran into a lady who happened to have a whole closet full of, of her husband's clothing from the 1930s, so we were excited to get a couple of these suits. And it's a wonderful tweed suit, just really quality material. And the vest, material. of course, with the beautiful buttons. I don't know those at home can see that, but they were just absolutely beautiful, very fine, yeah. much smaller than you would normally see in a men's clothing store today. So it's been fun. It's been an interesting learning experience. Oh, and the ties. And these are some lovely <laughs> ties <Hello? laughs> with an Art Deco <laughs> flair that we couldn't resist. So we were, we were looking for things that were, the men's clothing hasn't actually changed that much. This looks like a bullseye so here, we don't you? for unique <laughs> changes, yes. It's a quality piece here. Um, a lot of the ladies' clothing was donated by the Costume Bank, which is, is local, and there's just some wonderful pieces in here. Ooh, why don't you pull out just one for some of our viewers out there who may be interested? Yeah. Lovely oh. stereotypical dress from the 1930s, and once again, we were looking for something that we thought would be appropriate for a farm family, and, and this would be, our feeling is this would be kind of your Sunday best for Beautiful. going to church. So. Um, one important thing that we've tried to bring into all of the clothing exhibits is that hats and gloves were really common to most of the ladies' outfits and to the men. So we have both both of the hats. Ooh. And one other irresistible element of the clothing are the bathing suits. Oh, now with some? summer approaching us, I tell <laughs> you. The moose head pattern, it's just... And you're nice lady. Lovely. So I think baby suits have come Super. a long way. Erin, I'd like to thank you so much for giving us such an exquisite tour of the Los Altos History House, and obviously on behalf of all the volunteers who equally appreciate the energy and effort that you've put into uh, coordinating the uh, restructuring of this house. We encourage any of you viewers, if you have a Saturday, Sunday afternoon with something that you're looking forward to doing here in Los Altos, coming to the Los Altos History House is absolutely a must on any tourists or locals' agenda plan for the weekend. Thank you.